Growing up, I was a huge fan of superheroes. I read all the comics, watched all the TV shows and movies. And I remember in just about every episode, there was a scene where it looked like everything was lost. Someone, often the love interest of the hero or innocent bystanders, are staring down the barrel of a gun. They're in the clutches of the villain. Some tidal wave or wall of fire was coming right towards them. In any second, they'd be wiped out. And there was no hope of rescue, no chance of survival. And that is when the hero swoops in and saves the day. He punches out the bad guy, grabs the victims, and flies off to safety. And you know, there might be many reasons why the characters ended up in that peril. In some cases, like with Lois Lane, they got themselves into trouble, going where they shouldn't have gone. And other times, they were just minding their own business when robbers bust into the bank, guns a-blazing. But do you know what this story never does? It never asks why. The people are in trouble, and it's the hero's job to save them. The hero didn't get them into that mess. He's the one who came to rescue them. There might be many reasons for why there are villains, calamities, and crises facing these people. But we know what the hero is about. He's the one who brings salvation. So, what does this have to do with the gospel? The foundation of the gospel is grace. As I've said many times before, grace is God's unmerited favor. He is providing you with abounding favor, kindness, goodness, help, that you cannot earn or deserve yourself. Merit, by the way, doesn't only mean earned. Merit means being worthy of something, either because of what you do or something else, like your birthright, your age, your race, etc. God's grace is unmerited. You are not worthy of it in any way, shape, or form. We can receive God's grace because Jesus Christ made it available to us through the cross. You can't earn God's grace, but he earned it by dying for our sin and rising again. Because we are standing in the grace of God through Jesus, we can expect good things from him. God is now our loving Father. He is not angry with those who believe in Jesus, because Jesus has reconciled us to the Father. That means we are on good terms with God. We were his enemies, but now we are his beloved children. And because of this, we can ask for anything from God, and he will answer our prayers. He is not sending pain, destruction, or misery our way, but only good things. Psalm 34.10 says, Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Of course, that raises a pretty important question. If Christians have God's abounding grace, why do they still suffer? Why do Christians go through hard times, get sick, and appear to have the same kinds of problems as everyone else? Well, this is a question Christians have wrestled with for centuries and unfortunately has led to some wrong beliefs that insult the character of God and diminish his grace. Some claim that because God is sovereign, he is the one sending us problems. And since he's behind your suffering, there must be some reason he's causing it, like to teach you something. Christians chalk up the problems in their lives as being God's will. Because if God is sovereign, he's the reason you're suffering. Because nothing can happen that's not God's will, right? So these problems are in your life for some greater purpose. So who are you to ask God to fix them? Now that sounds wise and spiritual, but has led to some very bad conclusions by Christians. They think God is behind their sickness, struggles, or pain. And they refuse to believe that God can or will heal them, provide for them, or help them in times of need, which is a direct contradiction of what the Bible says. So what's the truth? Why do Christians suffer? What does it mean that God is sovereign? And what does this all have to do with grace? Well, these are not small questions to answer, but we're going to look at what the Bible has to say. I'm Adam Casalino, and this is the Gospel Talker Podcast.
So if you're new to the podcast, please check out my first two episodes. In them, I go into detail explaining how important grace is for the believer. And that'll help you uh, before we jump into today's topic. Okay, so what the heck is sovereignty? Now, depending on what Christian tradition you come from, you may have a very different understanding of what this word means than others. Some Christians actually deny or undermine the idea that God is sovereign. They might even say, and I've heard teachers say this, that sometimes God's will isn't done. That, I will just say, is a lie. God's will is always done. And we know this because he said it himself in Isaiah. Chapter 55, verse 10 and 11 says this, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So did you catch that? God's word never returns to him void, meaning God always accomplishes what he sets out to do. That doesn't necessarily mean we are in the will of God, we'll get to that later, but that God's plan cannot be thwarted by sin, evil, or the devil. To not believe this means you don't believe God is God. You'll conclude that there's some other force out there which on some level can undermine God's authority. Now, if that were true, we as human beings would have no hope in God. Because even if he were in control of 99.999% of the world, that 0.0001% where he's not in control would undermine everything else. Satan or people would exploit that small percentage and undermine everything else that God is trying to do. Imagine a spaceship's hull. Okay, It needs to be 100% secure, otherwise a small crack would be exploited by the vacuum of space and the whole ship would be destroyed. God's will is always done. But we don't always know what his will is. Or we don't see how God's will is being done at any particular moment in our lives or in the world. But God is always at work in the universe. His plan started at the dawn of time when he created all things. And that plan is still unfolding even at this very moment. Now one day perhaps we'll be able to look back and see how God's plan was accomplished, even at unexpected moments. But for now, we need to trust that what God told us in Isaiah is true. That passage is a promise from him. He always accomplishes what he sets out to do. Now, some Christians understand this, and they call this sovereignty, but they end up going into another kind of error. They understand God is sovereign, And there's some Christians who love using that word, by the way. It's just the biggest thing on their mind. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Okay. But what does that mean? Because some Christians will say, well, God is sovereign. And then they wrongly say, well, if he's sovereign, then everything that happens in the world, in life, has to be a part of his plan. It's God's will. And they assume even bad things are from God, and we should just accept them as they are. Now, these Christians might come from a variety of traditions, but they wrongly believe that bad things in their life are from God. And because of this, they might fail to ask God for help in any given problem. And I've noticed this is especially true in the area of healing. They don't think God will heal them when they're sick. Because after all, they think to themselves, if this is God's will, it's wrong for me to resist his will. Well, this idea is not only untrue, but it defames God's character. The Bible says God is a good and loving God who has promised to take care of his children. God is not the one who brings sickness, suffering, or pain for a new covenant believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, he is the only one who brings deliverance, freedom, healing, and provision. Let's take a look at a few passages that disprove this false view of sovereignty and that bad things come from God. James chapter 1, verse 13 teaches us that God does not tempt anyone to sin. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So this tells us one thing. When bad things happen in the world as a result of a sin, a sinful thing a person does, it doesn't come from God, right? Because the Bible says God does not tempt people to sin. In reality, he's the one calling us away from sin. So right there we see that some bad things are not coming from God directly. They're coming from sinful people who are disobeying the word of God. But what about other bad things? There are bad things that happen that don't result from sinful actions. Can those things come from God? I would say no. What God wants to do for us is always good. Paul tells us that God's will isn't evil in any way. He says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How can God's will be good, acceptable, and perfect if it includes terrible things like sickness, pain, betrayal, loss, and worse? As we read in Psalm 34, God is the one who provides us with every good thing. James says much the same when he says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. So Psalms, Romans, and James tells us good things come from God. Is sickness a good and perfect gift? Is getting hurt, being robbed, being betrayed by a friend, losing your job, experiencing heartbreak? We have to be honest with ourselves and what we say we believe about God. How can we say that God provides every good and perfect gift and that his will is good, acceptable, and perfect, and in the same breath say he's the one bringing suffering. But, but, but I thought God was sovereign. Doesn't that mean everything has to be from him? Doesn't it mean nothing happens unless it is a part of his will? That all depends on whether or not you actually know what the word sovereign means. Chances are, if you're listening to this, you live in America or some democratic country. So you don't have first-hand experience of what sovereignty looks like. In most of human history, especially in the times of the Bible, kings or emperors ruled the nations, and they were considered sovereign. Sovereignty is a governmental, judicial word. It means that a king was sovereign over his land. To the farthest reaches of his empire, his word was law. A sovereign king could issue laws or edicts, and everyone in the land had to obey. In some empires, the edicts of a king were so absolute that not even the king himself could reverse them once he signed them into law. And we see that in the book of Esther and in the story of Daniel in the lion's den. This is what sovereignty means. What the king says goes. But does that mean everyone in a kingdom was obeying the king's laws? Of course not. Throughout a kingdom, there were people disobeying the king. A human king couldn't be everywhere, so he sent out governors or other rulers to enforce his laws. And when these people found someone breaking the law, they brought justice. Some people might be disobeying the king for a while, but eventually, the long arm of the law would catch up to them. At least that's what should have happened. But what does this have to do with the king of the universe? God is sovereign, meaning... What he says goes. But at the moment, not everyone in his kingdom is obeying him. That doesn't mean they will get away with it. Those who are disobeying God's word will one day face justice. Jesus Christ himself will return to earth and judge the living and the dead. Just because right now there are many people and demons in rebellion against God doesn't diminish his sovereignty, right? You would agree with that? It only means that one day they will have to answer for their crimes. Today, however, for us humans, we have a chance to be forgiven of our sins when we repent and believe in Jesus. So you see, sovereignty doesn't mean everything that happens is approved by God. It can't mean that. God is the opposite of sin. He is righteous in every way. He sets the standard for righteousness. How can we say that a good and righteous God is the source of sin? And if that's true, we cannot rightfully say he's behind your suffering. So how does sovereignty actually work? Well, here's the key to all of it. 
Sovereignty doesn't mean God is behind everything that happens, but it does mean that he is at work making everything that happens fulfill his plan. There's a big difference between those two things. And Paul explains this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He writes, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. God is working everything that happens to, according to the counsel of his will. That means everything that goes on will result in God's plan being done. Notice Paul didn't say all things are God's will. He says God works all things to accomplish his will. So we need to tell ourselves that no matter what happens, God will use it to accomplish his plan. That's not the same as God doing or being behind bad things. You know, Paul himself was very blatant about accusing Satan for the bad things that happened to him. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, he talks about wanting to go back to see the church he planted, but he couldn't. Why? Well, he writes, Satan hindered him, not God. And in the book of Acts, we learn that Paul had to flee Thessalonica because the city was in an uproar against him. So he's saying that wasn't from God, but from the devil. And in a famous passage in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul talks about the famous thorn in his flesh. He doesn't blame God at all. He says it was a messenger of Satan. So Paul is very clear about where bad things come from. And Paul understood sovereignty and the will of God better than you and I. But he never said these things came from God. They came from the devil. But Adam, you might be thinking, doesn't God allow these things into our lives? Yes, he does. And isn't it the same as him causing them? Of course not. God can allow something bad to happen, but that does not mean he's the one doing it. Now, in your mind, that might sound like splitting hairs. And I will not argue with anyone stubbornly insisting that God allowing something is the same thing as him doing it, even though the Bible disagrees with you. If you think that God is the one behind your problem, why on earth will you go to him for help? Do you ask the person robbing you at gunpoint for help? Of course not. And thinking that God is the source of your pain will actually drive you away from him. The very opposite of what the Bible teaches us. You would do well to meditate on Psalm 34 in its entirety. But let's look at a few passages of what David writes in this psalm. He writes, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The young lions suffer lack and hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. And of course, the key verse in that psalm is verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So consider those verses and what they are saying. When we are in trouble, God is the one who helps us. Our attitude when we are going through hard times must be that God is going to deliver us. We turn to him for help when we are in distress. I'm not the one saying that. That's what Psalm 34 tells us. And this is one of many Psalms that teach us this truth. In a Bible full of promises that God is our help when we are in trouble. He is the source of our peace, comfort, healing, provision, and everything else we need. If we think that God is sending us the problem, it stands to reason that we won't ask him for help. We might even wrongly conclude that God wants us to suffer to teach us something. So, it must be sinful to ask him for help, right? How are we going to learn if we get out of the problem? This is bizarre, unhealthy thinking. And no one in their right mind would want to stay in suffering. But I know Christians sometimes think this way. Imagine what unbelievers must think of us when we say God is making us suffer. Then what is the point of suffering? In the early centuries of the Christian church, the Roman Empire and other forces persecuted believers mercilessly. It was normal for Christians to be harassed, arrested, 
punished and martyred. For the first 300 or so years of the church, this is what they expected. But something changed dramatically when the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. The most powerful man in the world was now a follower of Christ. He outlawed persecution of Christians. Suddenly, it was politically advantageous for people to join the church so they could win favor of the Christian emperor. It was possible now that many people wanted to become Christians not because they believed in Jesus, but because they wanted to advance their status in the Roman world. Now imagine how some sincere Christians would have felt during this radical time of change. Some of them were old enough that they remembered being persecuted horribly. But now it was fashionable to be a Christian. Their entire view of Christian life was turned on its head. For 300 years, Christians taught that you had to suffer for Christ through persecution. That was a rite of passage, so to speak, that you were persecuted for your faith. But that was no longer possible in the Roman world. These Christians thought they would miss out on some kind of reward or even fail to please God because they weren't suffering. So what did some of them do? They actually left human society and lived in the desert. Some lived in caves and other harsh localities. One man named Simeon the Stylite lived on top of a stone pillar just to get away from society. This was the beginning of monasticism, a movement that still exists to the day. It was founded on the wrong notion that a Christian has to suffer in order to be worthy of Christ. Do you see how flawed this line of thinking was? Supposedly godly men and women were leaving cities and countries, places full of people who needed to hear the gospel, so they could inflict suffering onto themselves. They were artificially manufacturing pain and hardship out of some idea that this was godly. But as strange as this idea is, Christians today still think like this. Some of us believe that we are not truly pleasing God, doing His will, unless we have some kind of hardship in our lives. And when things are going well, you might even get nervous. Because, oh no, God doesn't want me happy, right? Happiness is wrong, it's a sin, so God is getting ready, you know, I'm doing good, but right around the corner there's going to be some kind of problem, sickness, pain, to keep me in line. As I said before, this is bizarre thinking. Does a loving parent go out of his way to hurt a child? If their child does wrong, does a good father throw him out in the cold? Deny him food? Run them over with a car? You know, there are places where he put fathers like that. It's called prison. A good parent might rebuke or discipline a child, but not inflict suffering on them. Now, God does rebuke or discipline Christians. But the New Testament never says God disciplines us in the form of suffering. If that were the case, why is there preaching? Why do pastors or teachers instruct the church in the Word of God? Okay, God's Word is how God corrects or disciplines His people. And if you think about it, how else are you going to learn, apart from His Word that clearly tells us the truth? Now, you might reference a passage like Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 11, that says God disciplines His children. And I agree. He does discipline us, or correct us, or rebuke us. But tell me this, where in that passage does it say suffering is how God disciplines us? Go read that passage again. It's not in there. Now, you might have a translation that sticks that word in there, but they are changing the text. It does not say suffering is discipline. That passage simply states that God does, at times, correct us, or rebuke us, or discipline us. But it doesn't say how. The larger context of the book of Hebrews is needed to understand what the writer is saying. The entire book was a message from this apostle correcting and disciplining this group of Christians who were flirting with the idea of renouncing Christ and returning to Jewish law. God was disciplining them through this book. And that is how God disciplines us, through teaching, preaching, and reading of his word. Now, if you don't agree with that, think of it this way. If you think, say, a sickness was a way of God teaching you, then tell me, what did he teach you? Do you think he was teaching you to be more patient? 
Was your sickness punishment because of your explosive temper? Well, how do you know for certain that's what God was teaching you, right? He doesn't teach us through vague feelings and impressions. He teaches us with very clear instruction. Well, did you receive a prophecy from God that said this sickness was to teach you this, that, or the other thing? Did you have a dream from God explaining it? Did an angel come down and tell you that this is why you were sick, so that God can teach you this or that? Chances are that didn't happen. You never heard from God directly that the problem was teaching you anything. So why do you think that problem was sent from God to discipline you? You've only assumed that based on what you are believing about God. God didn't say it, you assumed it. In fact, you can't point to a Bible verse that says, Kevin, that illness was because you lie too much. Nor does the New Testament say that God sends plagues or problems because of our sin. Didn't Jesus die to take away our sin? Aren't we now forgiven by God through the blood of Christ? Then why would God punish you or even discipline you with suffering because of your sin? Now you might say, but God doesn't want me to sin anymore. Isn't it a part of his will to teach me how to live? Of course, he does teach us how to live. But how does that problem teach you anything? Jesus said his words are spirit and life. We only learn when we are told the truth directly in the Bible. God teaches us, disciplines us, corrects us, guides us, imparts the wisdom we need through his word. Remember, David called God's word a light to his feet and a lamp to his path. That is where we receive guidance and direction. Suffering doesn't do that. In fact, most of the time when we go through a problem, we are distracted from God's word. Our human inclination, when we are faced with a problem, is to become obsessed with the problem. And it takes a lot of effort on our own to get our eyes off the problem onto something else. Just ask someone who's sick, who's very sick. They're not going to theme parks. They're not going to whitewater rafting. They're not going out to big dinners with their family. They're just kind of stuck at home focusing on the illness. And that happens when you get bad news. It happens when something unexpected, unexpectedly bad happens. We end up getting completely preoccupied with the problem. And we're not thinking about anything else. So how is that providing guidance from the Lord? In fact, we need God to intervene in our situation so we can take our eyes off the problem and put it back onto him. And that is actually an act of his grace through the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who, at the first place, enables us to learn and understand God's word. So when you go through a problem, you need, you need God's help just to have the right perspective. And where do you get that perspective? From the Word of God. And what does the Word of God tell us about God? Psalm 112 says this, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. Does it say God is the one who brings pain and suffering? No, he is the one who brings our help. Of course, this brings up another obvious problem. If you think God is teaching you through suffering, then what is going on when you're not suffering? Is God unable to teach you when times are good? I'm sure you disagree with that, right? You learn even when things are going well. But how do you learn during those times? From the Bible? From a good teaching? From Bible-based books and other sources? Yeah, probably from all those things. So God doesn't need to make you suffer to teach you after all. Now, over the years, I've heard stories about parents who struggled because of their child's suffering. Their child was born with an illness or some kind of terminal infirmity. And I've even heard about pastors whose children who had some kind of chronic issue from birth. And in some cases, that children struggle with that all their lives. Sometimes they die young. And as a father, I could only imagine the pain they went through watching their precious child suffer. But all too often, I've heard some of these parents claim God was using this suffering to teach them something. They learned how to love or have compassion because of the horrible thing their child was going through. Now tell me something. Does God need to make your child sick to teach you how to love them? Don't parents with healthy children love them? So why do you think God needs to punish a child with an illness 
just to teach their parents something. You know, even healthy babies bring challenges for parents. There are plenty of opportunities for a parent to sacrifice, grow in patience, and grow in love while caring for a child. God doesn't need to inflict suffering for a parent to learn how to love their child. God gives us greater love than we can produce ourselves by the Holy Spirit no matter what our child is going through. Now, I'm in no way dismissing the great pain a parent faces when a child is ill. What I'm saying is, it is wrong to say God wants your child sick. He is the source of good things, not bad. You can ask why you are suffering all you want. That's not the point. We look to God for our help, healing, and deliverance, no matter what the problem is. So what does this tell us about our problems? What does the Bible say in terms of why we're suffering? We know God might be allowing the problem, yes. But the problem does not come from God. God is the one who has the answer to our problem. Our attitude during trials should be to expect help from God. That is what faith is. I said in my previous podcast, faith, as it says in Hebrews, is a substance of hope. And hope is a confident expectation of good from God. So if we say we have faith in God during a trial, that means we have hope that God is going to help us. And that is confident expectation that God is on our side, even in the midst of a difficult trial. And Paul says this about suffering in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which our, we ourselves are comforted by God. Okay, how many times does he say comfort in that passage? Do you see that? You may still believe God is sending you a problem to teach you something. But what does Paul say? He doesn't bother with asking whether or not our problem is from God. Instead, he emphasizes the fact that God comforts us during our trials. He is the God of all comfort. All comfort, meaning he provides all the comfort we need in any circumstance or any problem. But is there a biblical reason why we suffer? The truth is, God doesn't necessarily tell us why we are going through a particular difficulty. Some people, as I said, assume the reason. But apart from God giving you a direct revelation, you might never know. The Bible does tell us a few reasons why, in general, we go through difficulties. Remember, most of our trials are not much different than the ones unbelievers go through. They get sick, they lose loved ones, they're hit with setbacks. But when they have no hope, we have reason to be glad. Why? Because the trial is great? Because the trial produces something good? No, because the Lord has promised to help us. This is what James says about trials. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, you might be saying, he says God sends us trials so we can grow in patience. No, that's not what James said. He said the testing of our faith produces patience. And he goes on to say patience helps us mature in our faith. That's not the same thing as going through a trial. What is required for a trial to be a test of faith? That's not a trick question. It requires faith. A trial becomes something that tests or refines our faith when faith is involved. So here's the million dollar question. When is a trial a testing of your faith? Not when you shrug your shoulders and say, God sent me this trial, so I must grin and bear it. Remember, faith isn't merely saying something about God. It isn't merely saying you believe in God. It's not faith if you say, God sent me this trial. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Meaning faith requires that you are hoping for something from God. That's the Bible. That's not me talking. In the case of a problem or a trial, you are hoping that God is the one who's going to help you. Yeah, it's that simple. When you face a problem of any kind, the biblical response is to expect God to help you. 
Remember Psalm 121? I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you see that? The psalmist was writing about faith. He had faith that God was going to help him. Faith means we expect God to help us. Hope isn't saying, oh, I really hope God comes through. That's not real hope. That's the way the world talks. That's desperation. That's uncertainty. Real hope is a confidence that good is going to come. And we have that confidence in God because his word never fails us. He has given us exceedingly great and precious promises in the Bible. And because Jesus removed the conflict between us and the Father, our sin, there's no reason he won't fulfill those promises. So when you are suffering, you know what to do. You not just ask God for help, but to expect him to help you. And you could be that confident because God's word is very clear about who God is for you. Now you might say, that's easier said than done. Well, God doesn't expect you to do it in your own power. He doesn't expect you to do anything in your own power. Jesus said, apart from him, you can do nothing. And that includes trusting in him. When you are in the middle of a trial, you can grow in confidence when you meditate on God's word. David said in Psalm 1 that those who meditate, meaning thoughtfully ponder and consider, God's word day and night will be like thriving trees. Being confident that God will heal you when you're sick, provide a job when you're broke, open doors when it seems impossible, or will help you in any way takes supernatural faith. Faith is not rooted in your intellect, feelings, or willpower. Faith requires you to believe in something that you cannot see. Your earthly reasoning needs something earthly to attach itself to. So you cannot believe in God based on your own power. It takes grace, which is given to you through the Holy Spirit, who mentors you and coaches you and teaches you through the Word of God. You know how the Bible is called food for the soul, right? That means it feeds your faith. But not just mindlessly rushing through a daily devotional or your Bible through the year plan, but thoughtfully, prayerfully, thinking and pondering the word as you go about your day. You're just thinking about it, considering it, but it's God who is refreshing you, comforting you, encouraging you, and guiding you, even as you think about his word. This is something that God does in you. You don't do it yourself. Your job, so to speak, is to simply enjoy the word, even during a trial, the same way you would enjoy a good meal. Now think of it this way. When you worry, you are meditating on lies. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I don't do this? What if I don't do that? And what does that lead to? Fear, uncertainty, a lack of confidence. But meditating on God's word Trusting in God is the opposite. Instead of worrying about what might happen, you instead think about what God is promising you in his word. Anytime a fearful thought pops up, you go, God is going to take care of me. Why? Because I'm so good? No. But because God promised me he'll take care of me through Jesus. Now, your answer to prayer might not come immediately. When we have a problem and we ask God for help, there is often a waiting period between when we ask and when God answers. Could be long or short. Or God will answer, but in a way you're not expecting. Through that time of waiting, we continually meditate on what God has promised us. We keep expressing confidence that the Lord is going to help us when we pray, when we talk, when we think. Because he's told you he will answer you. We remind ourselves of God's word. We say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, which surpasses all my understanding, will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And other passages where God promises us many good things. Now, in any given moment, you might not see how God is at work in your situation, but he is. He often works in ways we don't see. And during that time of waiting between the start of the problem and when God brings the answer, 
He will provide peace and comfort. He will continue to do good things in your life even though you're in the midst of a problem. And that is what produces growing faith, as James says. Not because of the trial, but because God is providing for you. It's not the trial that's good. Trials are never good. But we can find good in a trial because of grace. God is the one who makes good out of evil. So when we face hardships, the only biblical response is to look to Christ. Do you see how this is the proper biblical mindset? Trials aren't good. Suffering isn't good. God is good. We can look at trials with hope, even joy, not because the trial itself is doing good for us. You know the old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's not true. There are many things you go through that make you physically weaker, mentally weaker, emotionally weaker. People in the world, when they go through hardship, they don't come out the other side better. Very rarely. Okay, they become bitter or resentful or mistrustful. The only reason good can come out of a trial is because of God, that he is going to provide the answer. Because of the abundance of grace we have in Jesus. Only God can make good out of evil. Good comes not because of the trial, but despite the trial. Not because you are faithful, strong, or wise in and of yourself, but because God promised he'd never leave you, and that is especially true during a problem. Now, there might be someone out there who is not on board with what I am saying. You are still convinced that God sends trials, that he is behind suffering, and it's godly, even sanctifying, to endure hardships without expecting any help. As I said, trials can produce in us good, even patience and spiritual maturity, not because of the trial, but because God is doing good in us despite the trial. But I know there are plenty of arguments against what I'm saying. What about this verse in the Bible? What about that verse in the Bible? What about that person in the Bible? Or I know so-and-so who did this and suffered this and da 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 So let's look at some of these arguments and why they don't hold water. First off, we don't look at circumstances in the world to define what we believe. You may have known someone who went through a difficulty and it didn't look like anything good happened. I'm not going to speak to that because we don't base our faith in what our eyes see in the first place. We base our faith on the promises of God in his word. So we're going to look at scripture, not in circumstances. There are a scant few passages in the Bible that can be taken out of context to suggest God is one behind our suffering or that he is, in fact, a source of pain and evil in the world. A common one you might hear quoted is Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, where it says, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. You see, someone might say, God creates bad things. In the King James, the word calamity is literally evil. So if you're not thinking right, you might wrongly think that this verse is set telling us that God sends us suffering and even evil, and we have no business to ask him for help. Now you'll notice the verse doesn't say you shouldn't ask God for help. But let's actually take a look at the whole context of this passage so we don't have a wrong view of it. It comes from chapter 45 in the book of Isaiah. And this is actually a prophecy directed to a specific person, King Cyrus of Persia. Cyrus, by the way, wasn't even born yet. This prophecy was written hundreds of years before he was born and came to power to rule this large kingdom. His kingdom replaced Babylon, and this Cyrus would end up returning the exiled Israelites to their land to rebuild a temple. In this message, God is explaining to this man that his success as king and emperor had nothing to do with his own ability or military prowess. God explains that he is the one who subdued nations for Cyrus, and that even included Israel, God's chosen people. Cyrus wasn't ruling over Israel or the rest of the world because he was just so incredible. It was because God was at work accomplishing a specific plan, and Cyrus was just a part of that plan. God actually tells Cyrus he brought him to power for the benefit of his people Israel. At the time Cyrus comes to power, Israel was in exile for many years. 
But now God is raising up this king so he could send the Israelites back to the promised land. God's purpose in this prophecy is to communicate to a Gentile king who worshiped false gods that he is the one true God. This is verses 5 and 6 of that chapter. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no other God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that you may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. So with all that in mind, we need to consider verse 7. God is not saying he is the one behind our personal suffering or hardship. He's not even talking about that. He's explaining to this king that he is the God over the whole earth. Cyrus is not God. Cyrus is not in control of his own destiny. But God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is. The destruction that Cyrus inflicted on the nations when he conquered them only happened because God was behind it. That is the darkness and calamity God is referring to here. Not all calamity and darkness, but the, the, the destruction and the power that was seen in Cyrus's conquests. Notice in the same verse, God first says he creates light before darkness and peace before calamity. The placement of those words tells us that light and peace are of greater prominence to God than darkness and calamity. And this calamity is actually the judgment God is inflicted or had inflicted on Israel through Gentile kings when they broke the covenant. But the story doesn't end there, does it? This prophecy refers to the end of the time of judgment when God raises up Cyrus, not to punish his people, but to restore them to the land. And does Cyrus obey? Oh, you better believe he obeys. This is what the man himself writes in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord of God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. That was written by a Gentile king, the most powerful man in the world at the time. God moves him to restore Israel to the promised land and even rebuild the temple. So why are we on earth focusing on darkness and calamity when this text is actually about God performing an amazing miracle? Israel had been in exile for years. They were in exile for two generations. When empires conquered a country, they sent the inhabitants into exile. And the goal was so that they could never rebuild their nation again. The people were scattered across the empire and forced to integrate into a foreign land. Over time, they would lose their own ethnicity and cultural identity, including their own religion, as they married into other people. Do you see how impossible it was for Israel to be preserved across several empires, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, so that 70 plus years later they could return to Israel and rebuild the temple? That has never happened with any other conquered nation in the history of the world. This is only proof that God was in control of what was happening, and his intentions were good for Israel. He didn't wipe them out, even though earlier generations of Israelites were horribly evil. God was faithful even when his people were not. This verse from Isaiah doesn't speak of God doing bad things at all. It speaks of God doing wonderful things for people who didn't deserve it. There are other passages people will use to suggest that God is behind suffering. But keep in mind, God won't do to us what he did to Israel. He sent them into exile because they broke the covenant. As I explained in previous episodes, we are in a new covenant with God that does not have the same terms. We cannot break this covenant because it is founded on grace, unmerited favor. The covenant rests on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. That is why we can expect good things from God, not evil. But what about this verse, which obviously suggests God's hurts us? 
In Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. As is often the case, people who defend bad teaching will take one verse out of context to defend their claims. Psalm 119 is David's magnum opus to God's law. He's rejoicing in the Torah, the foundation of the Old Covenant. So there are aspects of this psalm that must be interpreted by us in light of our covenant with God, the new covenant of Jesus Christ. We are not under the covenant David was under. We are not obligated to follow the law to receive favor from God. But David was. Instead, Jesus fulfilled the law for us while he suffered on the cross. Our covenant with God is built on grace through faith. Our obligation, so to speak, is to trust in Jesus, not to obey the law. That's important to know so we don't improperly apply Old Testament passages to us. Everything we read in the Bible needs to be interpreted in light of the covenant that we're in. So what about this verse? So we just throw it away? Of course not. We need to understand it in light of what Jesus has done for us. But even then, notice David doesn't say God afflicted him, does it? In verse 66, he also mentions affliction, but he still doesn't say God is the one who afflicted him. The theme of Psalm 119 is David calling out to the Lord to teach him. He's pleading with God to show him his ways. David understands he can't know or understand God on his own. He needs the Lord to show him the truth through his word. Again and again, he cries to the Lord to teach him his ways. In these verses, David is expressing the suffering he endured when he was ignorant of God's word. The affliction was the result of living in darkness without the light of God's truth. But that affliction was motivation for David to turn to the Lord so that he could cease sinning and learn from God. Again, he doesn't say, God afflicted me so I could learn this truth. He says good came from that affliction when he turned to the Lord. Psalm 119 is very clear that God teaches us through his word. David is blessed not because of what he does, but because God's word blesses him. The psalm is a celebration of God's Torah. Torah, which is translated law in our English Bibles, also means teaching or instruction. In the Bible, the word law doesn't always refer to the Ten Commandments and the other rules. Broadly speaking, Torah refers to all of God's instruction, which includes the entire Bible. So an appropriate way for us to interpret Psalm 119 is that David praises God for his word, that we celebrate what God is teaching us through his word, through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living word of God. God's word, his instruction, is what saves our lives. And that's true today as it was back then. David doesn't say God afflicted him. God instead is the one who bringing life, healing, and happiness through his word. So that brings me to the biggest bugaboo in this whole conversation, Job. What about Job? That's the big one. Anytime people talk about suffering, they turn to Job. God afflicted Job, didn't he? So that means when I suffer, God is doing the same thing he did with Job, and it's wrong for me to think any other way. Of course, that's a very bad interpretation of the book of Job. In fact, it's just the opposite of what the book teaches us. The beginning of Job tells us where his suffering came from. It literally came from Satan. The accuser slandered Job, saying the man only worshipped God because of his blessings. So God allowed Satan to do certain things to Job. First, he lost his wealth and his children. Then God allowed Satan to afflict Job with a physical ailment. You'll notice God sets very clear limits. Satan could afflict Job with sickness, but he could not kill him. That was a very narrow uh, boundary that deprives Satan of nearly every sickness imaginable. If you think about it, most sicknesses, if left untreated, will lead to death. Even a broken bone can lead to an infection that kills you. So even in this uh, arena, Satan had very few options because of what God said. What we see as God being cruel was a hard line that protected Job. The worst thing Satan did was a superficial ailment boils that looked very bad and probably were painful, but Job couldn't die from them. I bring this up to emphasize how much God looks after his children. We are so quick to defame God's character, saying he's behind our suffering. But even in the case of Job, God was setting limits 
to spare his life. People quote what Job says in chapter 1 as if his statement was biblically sound. But the Bible doesn't say that. It acknowledges Job did not sin by charging God with wrong, which is the opposite of what we do. We often charge God with wrong when we suffer. Instead, he simply worshiped God. That doesn't mean the exact words he says in that moment were right. It simply means his heart was right before God. Because he says the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we throw that out too. You see, sometimes God is good, sometimes God is bad. We just got to worship God. The scripture doesn't say that sentiment is right. In fact, we don't see that sentiment popping up a whole lot elsewhere to affirm God's character. We just saw in the Psalms, we just saw in the New Testament, that God is the one who brings good. He doesn't take away good. Now, there was a time when Peter fell at Jesus' feet and acknowledged his sinful state. In Luke 5, he tells Jesus, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. We never quote that as being a wise thing to say, right? You know, Peter's heart was right. He humbled himself, referred to Jesus as Lord, acknowledged his sinfulness. But his statement, depart from me, wasn't right. Jesus didn't depart from him, did he? Instead, Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be a fisher of men. See, this example with Peter tells us that we can have our heart right before God, even when our words are wrong. Paul even said in Romans that sometimes we don't know how to pray. We have a lot in our heart we want to give to God, but we don't know how to articulate it with our words. But the good news is God is looking at our heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. We look at Job's words and say, Heh, that must be right. When we forget it was his heart that was right, even though his words were wrong. This isn't a sin. Sometimes our words fail us. Sometimes we express the wrong thing. But when our hearts are humbled before God, when we are trusting in God, we are still in the right. See, Job did the right thing because he trusted God from the heart. But the book of Job is full of statements from Job and from his friends that aren't accurate. In chapter 3, he wishes he was never born. I notice nobody ever quotes that statement as being biblical. Was Job sinning? No, he was mourning all the bad things that happened to him. But his sentiment wasn't true. It wasn't godly. To be honest, he was being pretty melodramatic. And maybe we would say the same thing if we went through what he went through. Later on, when he was defending himself from his friends' accusations, Job does become proud about his righteousness. And that was wrong. In fact, we know it was wrong because when God appears at the end of the book, what does Job do? He repents. He didn't sin at the start of the book, but somewhere along the lines, he became too concerned about defending himself and his own righteousness. So should we quote the Lord gives and the Lord takes away as justification that God is sending our problems and we shouldn't ask him for help? I wouldn't. As I said, you won't find many more passages in the Bible that express that sentiment. Everything from Genesis 1, when God created all things and gave us life, to the New Testament where God loves us so much that he gave us his son, tells us that God gives and gives and gives. John writes, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Paul tells us God gives us all things to enjoy. James writes, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Our attitude of faith should be one of God gives and gives and gives, not the Lord gives and takes away. Unless you mean he takes away our sin, sickness, and sorrow because Jesus bore them on the cross. Now you can scoff at that and you can call me a prosperity preacher, but this is the gospel. We will have trouble in this life, of course, but God is the one providing the help we need. Psalm 34 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You know, you could use Job as an example that God brings suffering and pain, but you are ignoring a few critical facts. First off, Job wasn't in a covenant with God. You'll notice in the book, it doesn't say Job was a Jew. There's no mention of Israel, of the law, of Abraham, of Moses, of the tabernacle, of the Aaron priesthood, or the temple. You know, had Job been an Israelite, he would have had ample resources to aid him during this struggle. If he had lived during the time of the judges, he would have called on the judge who would have fought the bandits who robbed him. They would have gone out and recaptured what he lost. That happened all the time in the Old Testament. Or he could have called on the king of Israel to aid him. Or at the very least, his neighbors, the other tribes of Israel, who would have rallied to defend him. 
But none of this happened because he lived before God raised up the nation of Israel, which means he wasn't in the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. Why is this important? Well, God promised Israel that he wouldn't send them plagues or problems for no reason. He made it very clear that if they obeyed his laws, they would live in the land in peace. But if they broke the covenant, especially by worshiping false gods, he would send punishment. If an Israelite was going through suffering, he had cause to seek help from God. He could go to the high priest and offer up a sacrifice and do what they called inquire of the Lord, ask God for an answer. And if an Israelite had done any of this, he would have gotten an answer or help from God. We see that repeatedly in the Bible. Job did none of these things because he didn't have access to these resources. It would have been unjust for God to allow this against an Israelite who hadn't sinned. Job explains, in fact, he didn't have any recourse to go to God to sort out this situation. He didn't have a priest to mediate between him and God. He says this in Job 9, verses 30 to 35. For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on both of us. Let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Of course, that speaks of a mediator between Job and God. All right, in the Old Covenant, they did have mediators, imperfect ones, but they had them in the priesthood. Job didn't even have that during his crisis. There was no one who could mediate properly for Job based upon uh, an arrangement that God had made. He only had a few lousy friends who made the situation worse. But even though he didn't have access to a mediator who would work to remove the conflict between himself and Job, God was still faithful to Job. You see, people who love to use Job as an example of God sending us suffering seem to forget the last chapter. Now, according to some scholars, the, what Job went through lasted only about nine months. Then in chapter 42, we learn what happens next. Job's siblings learn about what happened to him, and they come and comfort him, and they provide him with gold and silver to help get him back on his feet. Then, God not only restored all of the things Job lost, but he gave him back double, twice as many sheep, camel, oxen, and so forth. And he even had more children seven sons and three daughters, the same number that he had before. And his daughters were the most beautiful women in all the land. And Job was so wealthy, he gave his daughters an inheritance alongside their brothers. And Job lived to see his children and his grandchildren. So the next time you are suffering, you can compare yourself to Job, but you better be expecting God to restore what you lost twofold. And if you think that God's not going to do that, you have no business comparing yourself with Job. Let me emphasize the most important thing about Job's story. We don't have to fear what Job went through because we have a mediator between us and God. Someone better than the high priests of Israel. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He has taken away the conflict that stood between us and God, our sin. There's nothing separating us from the love and favor of God. Because we are so good? No but because Jesus Christ died for us and rose again. We are forgiven by God through Jesus, and we have become sons and daughters of God. Even when we go through suffering, we can look to him for deliverance. The suffering didn't come from him. He allowed it, yes, but he is the one who is going to help you. Notice the origin of Job's suffering. Satan accused him of only worshiping God because God blessed him. This was an accusation of sin. Satan was accusing Job of being a greedy, selfish person who only wanted blessings from God. Because he said, if you take away those blessings, he'll curse you. Satan was saying Job wasn't worshiping God because God is God. This is what Satan does. That name means accuser or adversary. He wants to inflict suffering on us by using our sin as a wedge between us and God. But can he do that against us today? No, because Jesus Christ has taken away our sin. Satan tried to accuse us the way he did to Job. He'd have no standing because Jesus has washed us clean. There is no sin Satan can point to as grounds for an attack. What happened to Job can never happen again thanks to Jesus. So that means our suffering isn't the same as Job's. 
God allows it, yes, but it is only a means for more of his grace. It means our suffering is temporary. It is light and momentary, Paul says, and we can look forward to God blessing us during and after the trial. Let me leave you with this promise from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, comfort, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Suffering is only for a little while, but God himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The Gospel Talker podcast is written and produced by Adam Casolino. Visit us online at gospeltalker.substack.com.